welcome Scott. Uh, and uh, Scott has a, a first slide here coming up. And uh, uh, you can see on there that it features me somehow. So if you're wondering who's who in this slide, yes, that'd be me on the right with training wheels. So with uh, nothing further, Scott, welcome. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, you know, when we found out school was canceled during the, uh, on that Sunday afternoon, um, like everybody else, uh, I was sitting at home and, uh, and having a relaxing Sunday. Uh, and I decided, you know, I better get prepared. So I started up a Google Doc and the uh, Google Doc had three sections. The first section was um, a section that had distance learning principles that I thought we'd develop to guide our teachers. And the second section was for internal communications and the third section was for external communication to our parents. And uh, I was really confident with the work that I developed in this first Google Doc. So I decided to get my senior admin team to, uh, to join me in this kind of little endeavor. And so I invited them to get into the Google Doc with me. And uh, once I got them into the Google Doc with me, they started refining my distance learning principles and, designing the, and, uh, and helped to uh, refine the external and, uh, and internal communication. And, we had a really good document. Um, I was most proud of the distance learning principles that, that me and the senior admin team uh, developed. And we had about five. Uh, the first one, we wanted to focus on the four cores. We said, you know, eventually we might get into complementary courses, but to start off with, we want to just focus on the four cores. Um, second, uh, we wanted it to be teacher developed. We figured, you know, uh, these people are gonna need relationships. These kids are gonna need relationships now more than ever. We want the teachers to develop, develop and deliver their own lessons. The third one, as I said, you know what? We want teachers to send out their lessons. We want one email a week. We want all the learning for the week to be in that one email. The most sophisticated technology we wanted to use when we got started was a hyperlink in that email. So we want it to be super, super easy for the kids and for families that didn't have great technology. Um, the third one was that we wanted no more at the start than one assessment per week. We had to ensure that um, the expectations were reasonable. And you know, one of the reasons for that, if you look at, if you look at uh, Albert Bandura, a Canadian psychologist who, who wrote about self-efficacy, he said there's four sources of self-efficacy and the number one source of self-efficacy is mastery experiences. Uh, you have to succeed repeatedly to develop a sense of eff efficacy and success. And my idea was our kids need to, to succeed early and often. So one assessment per week was really, was really key. Uh, and the final one was that we wanted no more than, I wanted no more than three hours of work per day. I wanted the students to have a totally reasonable, I thought that'd be the very max we should have expected of them in these circumstances. So we developed these principles and we felt really good about them as a team, really good. Um, we felt so good that on Sunday night, this Google Doc was really refined. Uh, and this is the first, you know, the first night of school being canceled, the classes being canceled. So I invited all of my administrators onto this Google Doc and soon we started collaborating on it and refining it and making it more and more perfect. Um, by the end of that night, I knew I had total buy-in from the principals on the distance learning principles. And I knew we had total, even our principals were totally aware of uh, what our plan was, how we we're going to communicate it to our teachers and to our parents. We even had communications for future correspondences on that Google Doc. So our teachers, they knew where we were going, our, sorry, our principals knew where we were going completely. I was pretty convinced, I was so convinced that we could get going right away. I was kind of thinking in my mind, there's no reason that I can't meet with our principals on Monday afternoon and be rolling by Wednesday. Monday afternoon, just last check to make sure we're ready to go. Um, Tuesday, teachers get the chance to develop their first lessons. And then Wednesday, just start. That's what I had in my mind. And I didn't even tell my senior team that, that's just what I wanted to do. Um, so I was totally ready for that and I scheduled the meeting for Monday afternoon and I was ready to go. Now that's when the problem comes in because before that, Bevan and Barry from CAS, they call a CAS meeting, a conference call that, that the DM was involved with and you guys, many of you were on that call. And uh, 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 the first words out of Bevan's mouth completely undermined and made kind of destroyed my confidence in my, in my quick roll plan, get going by Wednesday. And the first words out of his mouth were, guys, I think we need to slow roll this. 
And I'm gonna let Bevan just tell me, give us a brief thing. Bevan, what were you thinking? What were your reasons for recommending the slow roll? There were, uh, in, in the conversations that we had, there was, uh, it, there was a couple things that had come up. Um, certainly uh, here we were, and we'd been talking to uh, a couple other districts as well. Uh, there were felt to be some challenges around um, how do we get started? How do we ensure that we've got something going forward that is going to be a good fit for everyone? Uh, we did have a, a little bit of a concern because at that time we didn't know what life would be like in the COVID world. And we'd been hearing some uh, pretty uh, difficult things coming out of Europe and what had come out of China. And we had thought to ourselves, are we, are we even gonna have any teachers to deliver programming in, in the next little while? Uh, what will this look like? And we thought that it would be good to have some time for our teachers to be able to uh, work together and to develop programming that they could collaborate on in, in the development of. And then uh, later on, um, if there wasn't, uh, if one of, some of our teachers weren't available to work because they'd collaborated and worked together and had teamed the development of what had gone out for kids, <clears throat> then uh, they'd be able to sort of uh, have each other's back and be able to deliver and mark and support kids uh, in larger groups. So we thought that we, we needed time to be able to do that. The second thing that we were uh, worried about as far as getting out too early was consistency. Uh, we were worried that uh, some teachers would would do, a, a, I won't say an amazing job, and some teachers wouldn't do an amazing job, but that there would be, the differences would be too large if teachers didn't have time to work through a process. Uh, it's sort of akin to marking diploma exams. The, the first couple of days of diploma marking are about standard setting. You don't mark anything. You just uh, pretend to mark things. You look at samples, teachers get together, they talk about what the standard is, and over that couple day period, you settle into what is sort of the norm, and you find your norms and what everybody agrees on. And so that those were a couple of the things that stood out as thinking it was being important. If we didn't have time, we weren't gonna be consistent, and we would have parents who would be upset, either too much or too little, um, and, and not a rationale behind it to say, no, this is what you know, we've all agreed on as a system. And the other part of it too is looking at it from a provincial lens. We're hoping for consistency across the province. And without time for district leaders to talk, to say, here's what we're thinking, what are you thinking? to go through all of that process, uh, you know, it would be possible, there are some districts that are very organized and could get out and get going right away and do a great job, but it might look very different from place to place. And that would be potentially a third concern. So I knew all of that's, those concerns. I've, I've since learned those things because I've talked to Bevan about what he was thinking on that call. But my exact reaction in the moment when I heard him say that was, that's a bunch of crap. There's no way I'm doing that. We worked all weekend. We were ready to go. There's no bloody way I'm doing it. But then I just started to think about it. You know, I started to process a little bit more. And I, I'm kind of going to steal from Dufour here. I thought, sure, I can get a bunch of lessons out. I can get my teachers to get the lessons out by Wednesday, no problem. But do I want to be the Charles Darwin school? You know, the survival of the fittest where, yeah, we put the work out there. And if you're smart enough, your kids, my kids in Okotoks, yep, they're going to do really well. My kids in High River, 60% ELL, they're going to tank. So I didn't want to be the Charles Darwin school. I also didn't want to be the Pontius Pilot school where we toss out these learning resources by Wednesday. And then we say, well, I'm going to wash my hands. I don't need to worry about this anymore. You know, in Dufour's words, you want to be the Henry Higgins school that, that can do, accomplish great things, uh, regardless of the kids that you're working with. The tools that you've got. So I, I, over the course of that late morning and talking with my team, I say, you know, I think I might actually just listen to somebody else for a change. I think I'm going to take Bevan's advice. And I started to get my head around this slow roll. And so I had my admin meeting that afternoon and that the idea of to slow roll this was what guided my thoughts. And as I just calmed everybody down and said, we're going to take a bit of time here. 
um, I could see my my administrators visibly relaxing on the Zoom call. Like they were kind of like, oh, thank God we got some time. So what did the slow roll do for us? I, I saw about I saw a bunch of benefits. The first one, like Bevan said, my teachers got five days of collaboration in their schools with their colleagues to develop their first lessons. Second, we had time to gather resources. Every student had this resource package that we all sent home. It had their books and resources that we could refer to in the lessons. So we had that time. We had time to check out technology. We, were, we, had, we didn't think we could do this, but we had every kid on a device uh, by the time we started. We had absolutely 100% uptake. Uh, we weren't doing any paper, thankfully. We, have, uh, we didn't have that internet problem. Um, and we also developed, our curriculum team developed a superb divisional lesson plan, a lesson plan that everybody in the division would have. So no matter where you were, uh, how many kids you had in our system, it didn't matter if they're in grade two or 12, they would have an identical uh, delivery for what that, that weekly lesson looked like. But you know, the biggest benefit of the slow roll for me was my evolving ideas about how we had to be reasonable in the workload. We had to be reasonable. And I remember I told you in our very first distance learning principles, I said, you know, there can be no more than three hours of work a day. It's just unreasonable to expect kids to do. It's probably in my mind, it was even less than that probably, but it was unreasonable in this environment with these conditions, with this amount of calamity, it was unreasonable to expect more than that. And I can remember uh, calling Bevan about that on my drive home. Do you remember that, Bevan? I, I called Bevan, it was about five o'clock. I'm on my drive home, it's Tuesday night. So one day after I decided to slow down. And I, I, I was, we were share, comparing notes as we often do about our respective plans. And when I got to the point of telling him what I thought about how much work we should expect, I actually held my breath because I thought, Maybe he's going to say, oh, that's a bunch of crap, Scott. You know, we, they should have a robust, full education where they're doing everything they would have done in class. And I, I thought he might question me and I thought he might uh, cause me to become reflexive again, like he did with a slow roll. Um, and I said, uh, so I said, I held my breath and I said, Bevan, I'm telling him I don't want any more than three hours of work a day. And then Bevan said, well, well, Bevan, you tell him what you said then. I have to say I'm getting far too much credit <laughs> in all of this conversation here because, uh, and this is a bit of a theme, um, the conversations with Scott had had a, a very large impact on what we did as a system as well. Uh, and, you know, the Scott had uh, such excellent uh, work down on paper. Uh, I was sharing that with our team here and we were going back and forth and it was causing us to ask new questions. And at that time, uh, we had been into a little bit of the research on what happens when calamity strikes, when there are disasters, when there's illness, when there was major issues, and you're moving kids from a regular kind of school environment into something else. And the, some of the research suggested that if you want to have success right out of the get, gate, look at 50% of 50%. So of the work. So we're really talking of a quarter of the work in the in the early going for kids to be successful, for them to adapt to their new world, to adapt to the fact that, you know, maybe mom and dad aren't working and there's other stresses, that everything's different. And so that had come up through the research that we were doing running running across that. So half of half. Um, so Bevan told me that, and you know, the first time he caused me to question my thinking and feel insecure and like I made a mistake. The second time that collaboration with Bevan affirmed my thinking. Um, uh, and as a, as a matter of fact, after he so firmly agreed with me about reasonable uh, work better, um, I spent the rest of the week talking to principals and uh, telling them to tell their teachers, whatever they've probably developed already for the first three, four or five days of school, it's probably already too much. Um, we have to do less better. It's got to be quality over quantity. Um, I was, I, I got so enamored with that theme that like we spent the whole rest of that, that week just preparing. And on the Sunday, I was kind of inspired and I was, I decided to write an article to my parents. And what the article was going to be was going to be really my defense of the slow roll. And I was going to tell them, you know what, because we didn't rush into implementation, when we do start on Wednesday, one full week later than I wanted to start, because we didn't rush into implementation, when we do start, none of your kids are going to be behind any of the other kids in class. And then I started thinking, well, 
no one's falling behind. Like, this isn't a local crisis. It's not a provincial crisis. It's not a national crisis. It's an international crisis. And behind is a relative term. To be behind someone, <laughs> you have, someone has to be in front of you. In this environment with the entire world's education system disrupted, who are you going to be behind? So I basically just saying, relax. Uh, I sent that email, that letter out on Facebook, and I never do that. I had our communication coordinator post it to Facebook. Usually I let our principals be the voice of our division. And she's since told me that the reach of that article is 30,000. Um, that article was sent out by principals in neighboring school jurisdictions, and it was even sent out by system leaders in other jurisdictions. That article and the confidence I had to write that article, in part, came from uh, my collaboration and consultation with Bevan and uh, and my confidence that our team uh, our team's decisions were good ones. So how did it all turn out? That's what we need to know. Um, we met, uh, we started out again on the Wednesday, a full week later than we expected. And we met uh, the, on the Monday following the first three days of school. And by the way, on the first three days of school, Wednesday to Friday, I told my, my principals to tell their teachers, give them one day of work for the three. We need to have success. We need mastery experiences. So I asked the principals how, how assignment completion was and unanimously they all just smirked and they said better than normal. Uh, so I was really pleased with that. After three weeks we did a survey of all our parents. We surveyed, we got 1,200 responses representing probably about 2,000 students in our system that's about 10,000. We asked them about their satisfaction with the quantity of work they're getting, the quality of work, the support for their special needs st students and students who need counseling, and communication from their teachers and communication from the division. The satisfaction rate was 92%. Um, I attribute much of that success, as I said, to the slow roll. And that's the end of the story. So what I wanna do now is just unpack it a little bit because I use storytelling to convey organizational beliefs. That's what I do my dissertation on. So I wanna kind of analyze the structure of this story. So first of all, um, one of the first things I, I Googled when I was doing my doctoral research was the structure of a story. Um, I wanted to know how a proper story was structured. And uh, I, I had lots of experience using organizational storytelling to convey beliefs, and that is my area of expertise. Uh, I've been doing PD for two decades, and I got lots of feedback on my PD. Uh, and I commonly got praised for the quality of the stories and how they helped convey the beliefs I was trying to display but I was unconsciously competent at storytelling. I could do it and it impacted people and it worked to convey beliefs, but I didn't know why. So I had to discover why. I had to become consciously competent about why these stories work. And so I found three different ways to conceptualize a story. And the first uh, is by Aristotle. And he said, a story has a beginning, middle and end. So I'll tell you that when I did my, first started my research, that's the first thing I Googled, story structure. The first hit I get, is Aristotle. And I'm thinking, awesome. I'm going to have Aristotle in my dissertation. I am such a genius. I was so pleased with myself. He wrote Poetics in 350 BC. And I'm thinking, I'm going to love quoting this guy. And then I see what he's got to offer me about the structure of a story. And he says, a story has a beginning, middle, and end. And I say, dude, you're an intellectual giant. That's the best you got for me is beginning, middle, and end. Are you kidding me? But you know, over the years, as I've really been attentive to organizational storytelling and, and how it works to convey beliefs, what I've realized is that's a very simple rule. There's, there's a simple structure. There's more wisdom in that, in that than I realized. You see, often I think we think we're telling stories, but what we're really doing is giving descriptions of endings. So I could say to you, we slow rolled our response to COVID and we got a 92% satisfaction rate. That's a description of an ending. It's not a story. It doesn't have a beginning or a middle, so it doesn't fit it. Uh, Vonnegut, uh, there's a great YouTube clip on him on story, to story structure, and you gotta watch it if you get a minute, but Vonnegut says a story consists of, often proceeds from good fortune to ill fortune to good fortune. And so, you know, uh, the structure that you can look at this is uh, uh, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back. And if you look at my story, I'll, I'll, you can see there's a little bit of ill fortune in it, and we return to good fortune as well. The final structure is by Smith, and he says a story can takes, consist of context, action, results. So the context is the setting, the characters. It's got to be set in a place. There's got to be real people in it, and they've got to have a, a real set of situation or circumstances they're responding to. There's got to be people in it. 
it's got to have an action, which is something happening and the characters, you know, encountering their conflict and deal with it. And finally, it's got to have a result. And that often contains a lesson learned. And I want to make a point about this structure. Um, when we as system leaders share our stories of practice, sometimes they're for entertainment. Sometimes they're war stories or horror stories. Um, and those stories are great. Those stories are a form of catharsis. There's a way, the way we bond with each other, the way we connect, and those are great. I have no concern with those. However, it, for a, 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 an organizational story to properly convey belief, there really should be a lesson learned. And so I always say, if you're gonna use a story to convey a belief, there's gotta be some element or identification of a lesson learned. So if you look at how I conceptualized uh, this story, um, uh, if you look at um, how I conceptualize this story, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the beginning, the good fortune or the context, first of all, we had that basic plan developed on Sunday. It was good distance learning principles and communication ready to roll out on Wednesday. Uh, we only missed, we'd only missed two days of school. Um, my ill fortune in the middle of my story uh, was when Bevan encouraged a slow roll on the transition to distance learning. It, it contradicted my instincts. Uh, and uh, it made me question my, my wisdom, basically. And the end, the good fortune, well, the slow roll improved everything. We, uh, we especially the guidelines about delivery, volume, and satisfaction. Just give me one sec. Sorry, I was just checking to make sure my screen was sharing properly. Um, so the next, uh, uh, so uh, like I said, when you're conceptualizing a story, uh, these three different ways are the way to, to conceptualize the first part. These are three different ways to conceptualize the second, and these are three different ways to conceptualize the third. So to move on, this is the next insight that I, that I discovered in the literature. Dowling uh, in 2006 said, stories can serve as, as mission statements. Um, and you know, when I think of a mission statement, uh, I often think of this. Uh, here's, here's a good example. In a safe and caring culture, focused on lifelong learning, cliche, cliche, cliche. Uh, mission statements, rhetorical mission statements have never done anything for me. You know, a mission statement is just a shared belief, a communal belief that leads to common action, right? That's really the purpose of a mission statement. You wanna have a sh uh, shared core beliefs that guide you in common action towards something good. Well, I don't think mission statements are memorable enough. I think we need mission stories. Because a story that conveys a belief about a lesson learned and can guide your organization um, is far more powerful because we're transported into stories. We identify with the protagonist. We want them to address the conflict and have a, a good resolution. A story sticks in our memory. So it's far better and more memorable to identify those core stories in your organization, those epic myths in your organization, and use them to guide belief and to inspire new action toward new behavior. Now you might think the slow roll, uh, the underlying mission of it or the, the message of it is, is about how Christ Redeemer's plan was amazing. Uh, COVID plan was amazing. Our distance learning plan was amazing and it was not. You might think the core belief behind it was to do things slowly and deliberatively and it was not. The whole point of that, the, the, the mission for me, the, the belief I wanna convey is our system developed a great plan, but it got better when I started collaborating with a critical friend. Um, and that was Bevan. There you go, Bevan, more credit for you. Um, David, Boge, uh, da David Boji, not David Bowie, but Boji in 91, he said a, a story is like a precedent in common law. And just like a precedent in law guides future legal decisions, the message of a story can be a precedent to guide behavior into the future. So it's like, oh, we did that once and it worked. Let's do that again. Or, you know, that's kind of what I mean by it. So um, I, I, I say that the, the precedent for me in the slow roll story, um, I think it helps to combat what I call write a lot syndrome. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're a system leader, especially if you're a chief superintendent, chances are you spent an entire career being mostly correct. You've made a lot of good decisions. That's write a lot syndrome. Um, the problem with write a lot syndrome uh, for me, and this is very personal to me for sure, the problem with write a lot syndrome is that uh, sometimes your senior admin tables can turn into echo chambers. And you know, there, there's two echoes. And my team, they'll laugh when they hear this. The first echo is me. 
saying the same thing over and over and over again, conveying the same beliefs, having the same positions based on the same values. It's an echo chamber. The second echo, because of write a lot syndrome, because um, I have been right a lot, is my team tends to just echo my ideas. Yeah, Scott, that worked. He was right before, he's probably right again. And the problem with, with write a lot syndrome in your echo chambers is that you just become too insular. You know, one call to Bevan um, and one uh, uh, interaction with him helped me critically evaluate my ideas. Um, and to me, that the lesson of the story is you know what, even if you think your plan's perfect, perfect, get out of your echo chamber, get, reach out to other system leaders. They have a different perspective. And guess what? They're just as cocky and certain about their positions as you are. So it's the best place to find a critical friend. And that's kind of the next one. Um, I, I, I learned in the research that uh, stories serve as ostensive definitions. And what an ostensive definition is, is if a complex, if a concept is too complex to define rhetorically, like a really complex con, uh, concept like vision or transformational leadership, really, really complex concepts, uh, an ostensive definition is how you define something by the provision of examples. Well, a story serves as the most perfect, most memorable example. You know, you think of ostensive definitions, we do them all the time in teaching, right? You give the definition for photosynthesis, who cares? That doesn't mean a thing. It's not until you give examples and non-examples of what it is and what it isn't that people really understand it. Your stories are ostensive definitions. And to me, if I wanna talk about the concept of having a critical friend, that this little short and these short kind of polyphonic interactions that Bevan and I had over the course of that week um, did more to did more for our plan than anything I could have done in my echo chamber. Uh, and so for me, uh, that story is ostensibly defines the importance uh, of relying on critical friends from CAS that are, are, you know, have the confidence and the gravitas to, to challenge you and to challenge your ideas and to interrogate your ideas. And, and that's what I found Bevan did. The final concept that I want to talk about is the concept of springboard stories. And Denning said that, um, uh, and Santiago, this is probably what's going to connect most with your talk. Um, what, what Denning identified is that, you know, you can have a springboard story about an organizational uh, event from the past or even a desired organizational future, the stories of the future about what we hope to attain that can serve as a springboard for action. This story that I've told is a springboard for me toward future collaboration, future reaching out. And I'm hoping for the listener, it's a springboard that will make them think, maybe I need to get out of my echo chamber too. Uh, that's the whole point of it. Uh, but one of my observations is there's a second, uh, I can give a second nuance for the springboard concept. I think springboard stories, what I've naturally found is that you, know, you get a story, you give a story, you get a story back. Um, and that's what happens with system leaders, right? If, if there's five of us in a room and we're all talking about the same problem of practice and I tell my story about responding to that problem of practice, what naturally happens is the other four system leaders are going to share their own story. And when we do that, we've got five heuristics about how to solve a problem of practice. And that's the beauty of the springboard concept. It, um, it, can, it can absolutely, uh, we can learn from each other and it just naturally occurs. And in this session where I'm about to finish up here and you're to go into breakout groups, uh, one of the first things we ask you to do is to uh, unpack my story, talk about my story. I can almost guarantee you, no one's gonna do that. Because the second you start talking about mine, you're gonna think of your own and that's exactly what I want. <laughs> um, I want, groups of system leaders to get together and to talk about uh, about the, their stories of responding to this problem of practice related to COVID uh, in their own kind of sandbox, their own area, whether, whatever that may be. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to break into breakout rooms here, real like breakout groups. You're going to select a facilitator first, um, and that is going to be the person with the most years experience in education. Then the facilitator, just please get people to introduce one another. Um, and then uh, uh, you can reflect on my story if you like, but probably you're going to start telling fragmented stories of your own problem of practice. And they're not going to be as long as mine, and they're not going to be as, as kind of orderly as mine. I thought about mine longer, but try and give a bit of context, action, and result. Don't just tell the, don't just describe the ending. And then when we're done, we'll, we'll have hopefully about 15 minutes left 
and we'll uh, come out and if we do have time, the facilitators just I'll give you one or two minutes to just share anything you want to share that arose out of your conversation. And no rules, just anything you might want to share. <laughs> 